TCP IP is a family of data transfer protocols that makes modern network communications possible. The first step to understanding data transfer protocols like TCP IP is understanding what data networks are and how they work. A data network is a group of computers, or increasingly these days, computer-like devices, that talk to each other over a shared connection. Data and requests for data from a computer pass through the network to another computer. These requests might be transmitted over copper network cables, fiber optics, or radio waves. For even the simplest network, like this one, there are a couple key pieces of functionality that have to exist. The computer named BOS1 has to be able to transmit a message to the computer named BOS2. BOS2 has to be able to understand the message from BOS1, and it has to be able to respond by sending a message back to BOS1. A networked computer interacts with other computers through applications. An application performs a specific set of tasks, and it's responsible for managing the receiving and transmitting of data required to perform those tasks. For an application to be useful, it has to be able to communicate with applications on other computers on the network. A network protocol is a set of explicit rules that defines how applications communicate with each other. Data flows from an application on one computer down through that computer's network hardware, across the network to the correct receiving system, and up through that computer's network hardware to the receiving application. Some common applications you might be familiar with are SMTP, IMAP, POP, HTTP, SSH, NFS, and FTP. The TCP IP family of protocols defines the process used to transmit data across a network, and equally important, how that data should be formatted and packaged so other computers on the network can understand it. TCP IP and its family of related protocols provide a complete system that defines how data should be formatted, transmitted, and received on a network. The actual work of formatting, transmitting, and receiving data with TCP IP is performed by a special software package, the TCP IP implementation. On the OpenVMS operating system, the Multinet and TCPWare software packages let servers process TCP IP data and participate in data networks. Today, TCP IP is the de facto standard for data transmission across every kind of conceivable network. But back in the 1970s, the world wasn't that simple. To keep the history lesson brief, I'm going to simplify just a bit and say there were two kinds of networks being developed in the 1970s, local area networks and the ARPANET. In the late 1960s, the powers that be at the U.S. Department of Defense took a hard look at their computer systems, and they pretty quickly figured out that they had a bunch of systems that couldn't talk to each other. There were some small pockets of network systems, but they used proprietary protocols that were specific to a particular manufacturer. At that time, computer manufacturers thought they had a vested interest in not interoperating with systems from competing manufacturers. They wanted to lock customers into their systems. But the folks at the Pentagon had different ideas. They wanted all of their disparate computer systems to be able to share data back and forth across a common network. Being the Defense Department, they had some requirements that the proprietary local network protocols of the day didn't support. They figured, correctly, that this new network would become a target of attack for foreign militaries. Because of that, the most important new requirement was that the network had to be decentralized. In other words, critical services couldn't be concentrated in a few vulnerable points of failure. If a foreign power attacked the U.S., those critical points would probably get hit with a bomb or a missile or whatever and take down the network right when it was needed the most. The DoD wanted a network without any points of failure, a network where a bomb could land anywhere and the network would stay up. The task of designing this network got assigned to the Advanced Research Projects Agency, and ARPANET was the result. The protocols that ARPANET was built around were the forerunners of modern TCP IP. A few years later, the National Science Foundation wanted to build a network connecting research institutions around the globe. They adopted roughly the same system as ARPANET and built what we now call the Internet. The decentralized design requirement for ARPANET is a big reason TCP IP was successful and remains the dominant data transfer protocol decades later. There are two important features of TCP IP that provide a decentralized environment. The first is end node verification. The two computers that are actually transferring data back and forth, 
called the end nodes, because they're at either end of the chain of equipment the data travels through, are responsible for making sure the data is transmitted correctly and completely. Every computer on a network is basically the equal, a peer, to any other computer on the network. There's no central control scheme that's responsible for making sure the right data ends up where it needs to go. The second decentralizing feature of TCP IP is dynamic routing. Computers are connected to each other through multiple paths, and the equipment along the paths, the routers, are responsible for choosing the best path data should take based on current network conditions. Around the same time the ARPANET was being developed, commercial local area networks, or LANs, were also starting to come into their own. Early LAN systems didn't really account for any kind of larger network environment, like the internet, and they depended on highly proprietary protocols. If you bought a computer from one vendor, you were pretty much forced to buy all your computers from that same vendor if you wanted them to talk to each other. The introduction of the internet and most large universities and research institutions made several companies take a sharp look around, and they decided that the same protocol family, TCP IP, would be a great way to make all of their incompatible computers and LANs talk to each other. As the internet became more and more popular, the users on these corporate LANs started nagging their management and IT departments about getting access. Electronic mail alone could cut days out of critical business processes and increase everyone's efficiency, not to mention it saved a lot of trees. Initially, some vendors provided specialized gateways that converted proprietary LAN protocols back and forth into TCP IP. As the internet continued to become more important and corporations started to lose patience with proprietary network protocols, any LAN software that was going to survive commercially switched over to TCP IP. All right, brief history lesson over. There are five key problems any kind of network has to solve. Addressing, routing, name resolution, flow control, and support for external applications. These five issues really drove the design decisions made for TCP IP. Any device connected to a TCP IP network has a physical address, a unique number that identifies it. That unique number is burned into the device at the factory and it's guaranteed to be unique across all devices that ever have been or ever will be connected to the internet. The technical name for that unique number is a machine access code or MAC address. On a LAN, the low level TCP IP protocols use these physical addresses to move data across the physical network and make sure it's received by the right device. The physical MAC addresses are used kind of the same way the phone companies use phone numbers. When I want to talk with my mother, I dial her phone number, the phone company knows which phone corresponds to my mother's unique phone number and routes my call to that device. As a user, you don't see it, but there's about 100 years of research and billions of dollars of equipment required to make that happen. On a small and simple network, a computer can just dump data directly onto the physical network. Every computer on the network examines every bit of data that goes across the network and decides which transmissions are meant for it based on its physical address. But what about larger networks? It isn't really possible for every computer to listen to every piece of data going across big networks with thousands of systems. And then there's the internet. Trying to listen to even a millionth of the internet's traffic would be like trying to drink from a fire hose. As you add more and more computers to a network, it becomes less and less practical to use a basic physical addressing scheme that sends all data to all systems. At some point, it'll stop functioning efficiently, and shortly after that, it'll stop functioning at all. The solution is to throw hardware at the problem in the form of routers. Routers let you break a big network into smaller networks called subnets. With a little bit of careful planning, you can use routers to break a large network into a tree-like hierarchy of smaller subnets. The hierarchical design lets data travel efficiently across the tree to its destination without forcing every computer on the network to examine it. TCP IP lets you break giant networks into smaller, more manageable networks through logical addressing. A logical address, known as an IP address, is configured in a computer's TCP IP software package. Generally, an IP address is a number composed of three network IDs, the network ID number, the subnet ID number, and the host ID number. If you do a little bit of planning before randomly assigning IP addresses to computers on your network, you can match them up with the internal organization of your network. Routers are special devices that, as their name implies, route data back and forth across networks. A router understands the logical address information contained in a piece of data transmitted over a network and uses that to direct the data across the network to its destination. 
if it's set up correctly, a router lets you separate a subnet from the larger network. The router keeps data being transmitted between computers on the subnet from being passed up to the larger network. This keeps a lot of traffic that really doesn't need to be there from cluttering up the physical network. Of course, if a piece of data is addressed to a computer outside of the subnet, the router will forward the data onto the larger network. Large redundant networks, like the internet, have huge numbers of routers and multiple possible paths between computers. TCP IP includes protocols that specify how routers should pick the best path through the network to transmit data. A system's logical address, or IP address, is definitely a little user-friendlier than a network adapter's hexadecimal physical address, but it's still not really something your average user can, or should have to, deal with. Unless you're a serious network guy, you'd probably have a hard time remembering if a particular computer's logical address was 10.1.1.11 or 10.1.1.12. To solve the problem, TCP IP provides a structure of human-readable system names. These user-friendly system names are called domain names. You see these domain names everywhere, www.process.com, mail.wku.edu, travel.state.gov, and so on. The process of mapping a logical IP address back and forth to a domain name is called name resolution. Special servers called name servers store database tables, which provide the information for the back and forth mapping of numbers and names. TCP IP's Domain Name Service System, or DNS, sets up a hierarchy of these name servers that can handle all of the back and forth mapping for the entire internet. Thanks to this system, it's a pretty rare thing for an average user to have to deal with numerical addresses. There are several features of the TCP IP protocol family that guarantee data will be delivered reliably over a network. These features include checking transmitted data for any errors, so computers can be sure that the data they receive is exactly the data that was sent. Definite acknowledgments of successfully receiving data, so a computer sending data can be sure it got to where it was supposed to go. And flow control, so computers and routers along a data transmission path can speed up or slow down data rates without having to use a separate communication channel. Everyone knows you can run multiple networked applications on the same computer. Can you imagine how annoying it would be if you had to close your email client before you could browse the web, and vice versa? TCP IP supports multiple applications simultaneously through logical channels, referred to as ports. Every port has a unique number that's used to identify that port. An easy way to understand the concept of ports is to think of them as logical pipelines through the network stack. Data can flow back and forth between the application and the network stack through these pipes. A big reason that TCP IP became the dominant data networking protocol is that it's based on a set of open and very complete standards. That means anybody with sufficient engineering skills can develop software and build hardware that's guaranteed to work with any other device connected to the internet. There are several organizations that have been around since the beginning of the internet that are tasked with developing new standards and making sure everyone plays by the same rules. There are a couple major standards organizations that you'll hear mentioned frequently as you learn about TCP IP. The Internet Architecture Board, or IAB, is the governing board that sets general policies for the internet and manages development of data protocols and standards. The Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, is the branch of the IAB that conducts engineering research and develops the standards for each part of the internet. The IETF is split up into working groups that focus on a particular part of TCP IP, the internet, and applications like email or the web. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, is responsible for managing IP addresses, domain names, and port numbers. The standards published by the IETF are commonly referred to as RFCs, short for Request for Comments. Generally, each piece of TCP IP and the internet has its own RFC, or set of RFCs, that explicitly lay out the standards that implementations are expected to adhere to. Even if you're not developing your own TCP IP implementation, the RFCs are a fantastically rich resource for gaining a deeper understanding of TCP IP and the internet. Every RFC is freely available from the IETF website at www.ietf.org. In this webinar, we've covered the basics of what a network is and why networks are dependent on protocols like TCP IP. We've learned how TCP IP originated from a US Defense Department project 
and that the same capabilities that made the original ARPANET resistant to failure due to things like missile attacks make the internet resistant to more mundane failures like power outages. TCP IP's ability to provide a completely decentralized network that you can attach almost any kind of computer to is its key strength. We've also briefly looked at the five key features of TCP IP, logical addressing, routing, name resolution, flow control, and simultaneous application support. We've also taken a quick look at the standards and oversight bodies that define how the internet works. On behalf of myself and everyone here at Process Software, I'd like to thank you for spending a piece of your day with us. Hopefully you found this introduction to TCP IP useful, and you'll continue to learn more about this important family of network protocols. If you're interested in more information about our popular family of TCP IP implementations, just give us a call, drop us an email, or visit us on the web.